Give us one more just because we haven't heard it in a while. Here we go. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another amazing episode of JoFo in the Ring. I am your host, the harbinger of truth, Jeremy Prophet. And I am so glad to be joined by a guest today who has accomplished quite a bit, especially considering that they are someone who started out here in Canada. They were able to make a name for themselves on the independent scene, work their way up to the WWE, perform on national television, on pay-per-view, and proudly represent not only Canada, but Scotland as well. My guest, you might know him by several names, but probably most memorably as one half of a great tag team, the Highlanders. My guest today is none other than Robbie. Robbie, welcome to the show. I'm Robbie. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, you're, you're someone that I've crossed paths with a few times here and there on the independent scene. Unfortunately, never got to share the ring with you, but uh, as the people can see, you're still in fantastic shape. I'm sure you can definitely still go. And uh, I, I, for one, am hoping that that match will happen one day. And uh, I think a lot of people would love to see that. Uh, you are still still active in wrestling, right? It, it, it's funny. I just um, I just actually put a post on uh, social media about uh, accepting bookings <laughs> because I am almost fifty and I look pretty good. So yeah, you look amazing. Hey, you know I want to be you when I grow up. I hope I can look half as good as that when I'm your age. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know you, you've always been someone who's who's been a, a very helpful veteran. Um, I remember you know one of the first shows that we were on was in Barrie, Ontario, um, where I think we were working for, uh, for Matt Garrett. He was the, the promoter of that event. Um, and I had done the opening match with a guy from Winnipeg. And, and I remember you coming over after the match was done and, and giving us some advice. And I thought that was really cool because oftentimes, you know, not to say that, you know, a lot of the veterans are maybe more preoccupied with, uh, you know, doing their own thing or working the merch table, that kind of stuff. But I appreciated that someone of your stature and accomplishments would come over and see us who work the opening match and, you know, give us some advice to maybe help make our next outings better. Uh, Cause not a lot of guys did that around that time. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful of it. And that's like my first impression of you. So that told me that, you know, you're a good dude and you know, you care about this business and helping the next generation. And you definitely helped me there. Much appreciated. All right. I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, it, it is nice to give back. Um, I have been to WWE, so I've trained with some of the, some of, at that time, the greatest wrestlers uh, in the business from the 80s and 90s. And it's uh, good to give back and uh, be able to, you know, just give a little insight on uh, some things. And wrestling today is a little bit different, so it might even be hard to give insight now as opposed to, you know, when I met you. <laughs> That's true. But at the same time, as they say, you know, what's old is new again. And so I'm a firm believer that, you know, you can't, hey, someone who's been to the dance and made a dollar, you know, they definitely can can at least, you know, teach you some things that, hold, you know, hold it. it Jeremy, yeah. that was only about 50 cents. It wasn't a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm someone who, you know, I, I think that anyone who's made it, you know, they had something special that the company saw in them and it helped them get there. So even if, you know, some may say, oh, it's old, it's, it's old school or it's outdated. Look, you know, what's old is new again. And it's, it's to say that, you know, maybe there's only a little, maybe 20, 30% in there that, you know, still applies to today, but that could still be the difference between what helps you get noticed and what helps you stand out from the rest of the other guys who are there trying out with you when the bright lights are on you. So, you know, I never turn away from any advice. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's ignorant to do that, especially when someone has already been a proven commodity and showed that, Hey, you know, they made it there when so few have, uh, you're in a, you're, you're in a, in an elite uh, group of people, especially for the fact that you're Canadian. So you didn't have the same opportunities like the guys who were maybe, uh, you know, wrestling in Louisville, Kentucky or wrestling, uh, on the Florida or California independent scene, you know, you made it from, uh, here in Ontario. So yeah, yeah that that's was, really, uh, something. that was a lot of fun. Um, actually coming up through the independent circuit and getting yourself around to get noticed. Uh, that was some of the, you know, some of the, greatest times of uh wrestling because you know it's all new it's all fresh and uh it, it's pretty tough to be seen when you're up here in ontario when uh 
the WWE only comes around, you know, they come around about once a year, sometimes twice a year. So it's pretty tough. Yeah. Now, if we go back to the beginning, when you got your start in wrestling, how did that come about? Who trained you? And uh, what was, what was it like at the start for you? Uh, when I first, uh, when I first broke into the business, um, I, I did a little research and of course my research was something that was close to home. And uh, it just happens that uh, I was about 30 minutes from Cambridge, Ontario. And there was a place called the Hart Brothers School of Wrestling. And and I know it wasn't uh, no Hart Brothers School of Wrestling like uh, you get in Calgary uh, at the Hart Dungeon and stuff. Um, but my goal was to, uh, I had a family. I had to provide for my family. Um, I had uh, a wife and a son and a stepson. So there was bill money that had to be paid every Thursday, according to my wife, um, my ex-wife now. Uh, but that would be every every Thursday bill money. So you heard it on Wednesday. But anyways, that's besides the point. The Hart Brothers School of Wrestling, um, it, it was a ring. Um, it wasn't the greatest place in the world. Uh, but I did meet Smith Hart, uh, who was a great, uh, he had a great heart, um, yeah. a, a decent guy. A little bit strange, um, but God love him. Um, and I met uh, his his sidekick, Carney Joe Frockledge, uh, who called himself Ike Shaw. And uh, he was quite the character. Uh, he could eat pies. He could eat uh, cheeseburgers with triple cheese on every layer and probably put about six burgers on it. But uh, back to the Hart Brothers School, it was, uh, like I say, a ring. And they had some guys that had been trained by some guys. Uh, I started with a guy named, uh, his real name was Rory Polfus. Uh, his name was, uh, his ring name was Sid Summers. Um, he didn't do a lot in the business, but, uh, you know, he had been trained by some Davy boys and some other ones. And at that time, Waldo Von Erich was there. And um, back in the 70s, 60s, he was a name. He fought Bruno San Martino in the WWF uh, in a legendary match in Madison Square Garden. Um, so it's, it's not like they didn't have, you know, a legitimate person to help you, but it just wasn't, it wasn't the wrestling. I thought it was, you know, it, mm -hmm. but my whole goal was to get in that ring, learn how to wrestle and get out of there. Yeah. And, you know, you said at the start of this, that, you know, you're 50 years old today. Uh, I, for one would not have thought that you were, you were that old, but, um, I'm only 49, it... Jeremy. Oh, only okay. 49. Okay, don't don't let me age you here. <laughs> almost, almost fifty. <laughs> All right. Um, so with that said, I'm putting a timeline together here, and you know, I, I did my research before the interview, and I, I know roughly when you start. How old were you when you went into wrestling training? Ah, uh, twenty-seven years old. Twenty-seven. Okay, because that's I mean that's significantly uh, by today's standards a lot later than most people. I think by by any generation standards. Um, I myself, for example, like I started when I was seventeen. Um, which would have given me maybe a 10, 10 year head start on you. But I think it speaks to your ability, uh, learning ability and perseverance, you know, especially going in there and saying, look, I got to provide for my family. And at 27 years old, you're in there and then you made it to WWE, uh, you know, only a few years later. So, you know, whether it's a combination of talent or work ethic and just coming together, you know, you had that perseverance that allowed you to be able to get what you set out to get. And I think that's awesome. Uh, that, it's a lot of stubbornness. Um, one thing about myself, I can't speak for others, uh, but uh, I put if if I talk about it, I'm going to do it and I will get it done. Mm -hmm. um, but I might talk about it for a long time, like wrestling. I talked about for three years before I actually trained. But then again, I was only 165 pounds when I started working out. So mm -hmm. I needed a lot of uh, I needed a lot of gym time and a lot of food before I could ever even think about wrestling yeah. uh, until I went to an indie show and saw that uh, some of the guys weren't that big. And I was like, okay, it's time. And uh, it was basically, I put my head down and there was no, um, at that time when I do something, uh, there's no backup plan. It's uh, all or nothing. And, and I did get there, uh, started doing, uh, doing work for them at about three and a half years in. And being 27 was pretty tough. Um, everybody said I was too small and I was too old. But it turns out I'm probably bigger than most of the guys there now. Um, but I was more of an average size. And, 
in the big guy department uh, mm. back then. Yeah. Well, I mean, having met you, I mean, you go about, I'd say, what, 6'2", six 6'2", two, uh, six two or so? I, my ring, my ring, in ring is 6'2", but I'm really 6'1". And right now I sit about 200 pounds and, and that's a pretty ripped 200 pounds. Yeah. Cause I mean, in, in normal society, you know, you wouldn't be a small sized guy, but obviously at that time, especially in WWE, um, pre wellness, if I'm not mistaken, you know, there, there were some monsters over there. So yeah, you probably have been one of the smaller guys when you started getting your, uh, your first set of tryouts and a guy my size at at that same time you know would probably not have even uh they'd have been lucky if they'd have let me uh be an extra that you know gets beat up by by a guy you know probably twice your size um but that's the politics of it back then you know the look was very important uh as, as i feel it still is because wrestling it's, it's on television it's always going to be an aesthetic business and i think it's important that talent you know look like professional athletes look yes. like something that you can't just see, um, you know, working behind a counter at a seven 11 or your, your next door neighbor. So it's good that you had that mentality right at the start that, you know, you have to put the time and effort as much into your body as into learn the craft. I think it's a, it's a great message to a lot of the young talent out there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and so and you, you, you speak, uh, Oh no, go ahead. I, no, I, no, no, I, no. I, by, I, by all means, you, you were about to go no. somewhere. Good. Uh, <laughs> say, say what you're going to say. It was, it was no, I, I, I kind of lost, I kind of lost my train of thought. Um, so I, I it's okay. I should have <clears throat> cut you off earlier. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. Feel free to cut me off anytime. Everyone does. And I don't take it personally, What makes the I show fun. That. But, uh, no, all that to say, like, that's been part of my mentality, too, is I, I knew, you know, I had high ambitions and I knew if I'm going to get somewhere, you, you can't look like the kid next door if you want people to pay money to buy a ticket to see you in action or tune in to see you on TV. Um, yeah. So for me, it was always, yeah, the training and, you know, putting in the work as much in the gym as in school, uh, wrestling school and, uh, you know, fine tuning everything in my favor so that uh, I'll stand out from the next guy. Um, so in working the independence, that's where I first got to hear about the Highlanders. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that the tag team actually started before WWE. You guys were the Highlanders when you were on the Ontario Independency. Yeah, when uh, when when uh, Rory came over from Scotland, we got together and that would be about, oh, I'd say early 2002, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, we became the Highlanders, but, uh, you know, we didn't really stand out. We had short hair. I had, well, he was bald. Um, he'd he had had more of a disadvantage being a little shorter than me. Um, but he made up for that one, uh, you know, pre wellness, he got on the gas, got pretty big. <laughs> and, uh, I got pretty big on the gas myself. Haven't touched it since pre wellness, okay. um, and, or wellness, whatever. And, uh, but we had a disadvantage and, uh, you know, we, we looked like a lot of wrestlers and, uh, it, Oh, it, it took some time, but uh, we got around, and then finally WWE just said they didn't want to use us until, you know, we looked like every other guy. And mm. they said, we can probably use me uh, because I looked a little different. I had a good body, and I was taller. Um, but, you know, at that time, we we had to do some, some thinking about what was next for the Highlanders because yeah. we were getting lots of indie bookings, but it was time to go somewhere else. And we didn't just get into wrestling to be on the indies. Mm -hmm. Um, I like going back to what I said, I don't get into anything. I don't get any into anything just to be, uh, just for the fun of it. Um, in the end, it's got to have a goal, uh, and a meaning and actually an ability to pay your bills and live your mm -hmm. life and live your dream. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think that, you know, if, if you're going to put the time and effort, even even the abuse that our bodies go through and, and not just in the ring, but, you know, the long drives and, and you know, everything else, you know, it, it's something that you have to be passionate about. You can't just have one foot in it and expect the, the, the door to success to open. So I think your mentality right from the start was something that really helped to propel you uh, through the rough times that would eventually lead to getting the ultimate goal and getting signed. Uh, yeah. Like I like I said, I heard about the Highlanders. In fact, uh, one of the things I can remember vividly, I forget who said it, though, but I remember the exact quote was there were people who said, oh, the Highlanders, they're really good. But man, those guys are those guys are rough. You know, they're there. You had a, a bit of a reputation, at least in the circles I was in, as being a, a very snug tag team. You and uh, Rory. Do, do you feel that rep that reputation was warranted? I, I, I think Rory was a little more snug than me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Good I, I believe I believe I might have a little more athleticism in a, but for what I ended up looking like, you know, with the beard and the hair, I it didn't hurt to be a little rough. Mm. <laughs> So, so, so Rory was the one potatoing the guys, and then you were more, uh, more, more of the showmanship. I think I was more of a showman. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Fair enough. You know, uh, one of the first times now it's coming back to me a bit more. Uh, I heard a mention of you was a guy by the name of Carl LeDuc. He's uh, Paul LeDuc's son from here. And he said that he had a hand in training you guys. I think maybe at, uh, at Smith Hart school there at Hart Brothers. Is there, is there some truth to that? That Carl he helped was, you? Uh, he was there for a little bit, and uh, I did do a little training with him. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, he he definitely spoke very highly of you guys. He spoke very highly of uh, Eric Young. Also, was Eric Young also there at the same time with you guys? Uh, not at the exact same time. Uh, Eric had a. Uh, uh, had I known Eric had a place down the street, I probably would have went and worked with uh, Eric, not uh, the Hart Brothers School. Huh. Oh, look at that! Yeah, small world. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds like there was a good group of guys there and they helped set you on the right path. Um, and I think one of the things when you think of the Highlanders that really stood out was the, the characters because, you know, in, in ring wise, you know, anyone can do the moves, but it's the character that really is going to make you stand out. People see that on a poster and it's like, Hey, you know, what are these guys all about? You already have their, their interest. And I think that the Highlanders were always two very strong characters that, uh, I mean, I, I don't even think anyone else did it or has done a gimmick like that. Um, Certainly not in Canada since then. When uh, when we actually went in looking like the big bearded scruffy guys, uh, we had went in with kilts and uh, basically Stephanie pulled us aside and said, no one's come in here for like 15 years and ever showed us anything like this. <laughs> yeah. Too bad it didn't translate into world titles and big money. <laughs> <laughs> But it turned out into a good life, so it's all good. Yeah, and I mean, you'll always be remembered, and your your catchphrase of "I'm Robbie," I think that's it's it's legendary. It's iconic. You know, you probably still get people coming up to you saying it. It's it's. I was at WrestleCon a couple weeks ago at WrestleMania, and uh, this kid, he was about I'm gonna say 17 to 19. So we're going back 14 years, and he's just looking at me, and I said, "I'm Robbie," and he just. He, did, he almost went to his knees and go, oh, my God, it is, Robbie. It just went nuts. It was, it, it was quite the feeling that, uh, that someone had – I touched a little kid's life at about six years old that well. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's true. You know, the power of, uh, of, of being on television, having that platform, you know, you never realize how many people that can affect. And, you know, you probably even inspired other generations of wrestlers, whether, you know, here in Canada or maybe even in Scotland. Um, are, I, I miss being asked you, are you yourself, uh, are you Scottish? Do you have uh, I'm Scottish a, heritage? I'm born and raised in uh, Woodstock, Ontario. Uh, I do have a, a Scottish background. Mm. Um, but uh, my, technically, when I got into wrestling, uh, I planned on being a singles wrestler, but it turned out to be a, a tag team. But I was going to go under my, under my grandfather's name uh robert graham kirkati and that would have been rgk it would have had a nice little ring yeah but uh, it turned out different so i just used uh i used what i thought i could use and that it kind of worked out yeah was it, you came up with the McAllister name um me and rory actually were sitting around uh the guy at the hart brothers school of wrestling he what he, he we'd come up with the highlanders and he wanted us to be Connor and Duncan, and those are the names in the Highlander movie, and we're not going to be direct ripoffs of a movie. So, uh, you know, I want Robbie's a definite strong Scottish name, and so is Rory. So, we just came up with Rory. I, I don't know where we came exactly with McAllister, but it sounded really Scottish, yeah. so, and it had a good ring. Yeah, it definitely had a good ring to it. Uh, I, I myself, on my my grandmother's uh, mother's side, uh, have Scottish. So um, I, I've always been partial to the Scottish gimmicks in wrestling. The Roddy Roddy Piper, you guys, even uh, Drew McIntyre, you know. And uh, did did you guys get the chance when you were with WWE to go over to uh, to Scotland and actually perform there as the Highlanders? We we wrestled in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Scotland. It was uh, it was it was quite something. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine. Yeah, with uh, you guys representing them, and there was that time also they had you guys come out with Piper. Uh, I think on a Monday Night Raw. Uh, that, that well, be... we actually 
it, we actually did a tour with uh, Piper, and there's a couple nights where uh, over in Europe that we did uh, me, Piper, Rory, and Ric Flair against the Spirit Squad. Mm. That so, was right around the time when they were, uh, I think Piper and Flair were tag champs at that time. Yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I, I remember that vividly. Yeah. So let's talk about how you, you got into WWE. I'm sure you must have had several tryouts that led to you guys finally signing. So what was that like? Maybe walk me through the first tryout, how you got it and how it went. Um, we basically, it, it was putting the time on the road. We went down to Massachusetts uh, and we met Dr. Tom at like a seminar. Hmm. And we got to meet Dr. Tom and work with Chris Candido and uh, Dangerous Dan, or uh, sorry, Danny Davis, the referee who is also a wrestler. And uh, we basically, we, we worked with them one night and Dr. Tom and Chris Candido, they really liked us. And Dr. Tom provided his number and then we started calling him and getting booked all over the place. And uh, I want to say our first time was in Toronto, London, maybe. I have I have a vivid imagination, or I can't remember everything exactly. Time frame it just pops up once in a while. I'll remember, but uh, we did do a lot of tryouts, and we were, it was almost like we were going every other every other week, and you know, pulling in the five hundred bucks every two weeks hmm. uh, for being there Monday and Tuesday, and you know, finally it, it would have been about a year and. You know, we finally asked, we finally asked, you know, can we get jobs? And they basically, well, basically John Laurinaitis, uh, he basically crushed us and said we'd never have jobs there. <laughs> he was that blunt about it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I can take any guy, I can take any guys in OVW and put them in kilts and, uh, you know, call them the Highlanders. He goes, what makes you different? And mm -hmm. that's where. That's where the Highlanders evolved. We were just out of that, just out of that conversation of what makes yeah. you different, and that's where you know we were just. I had short hair. I looked like every other guy in the Indies with a decent physique, with the gas at about two forty, and uh, Rory looked huge. He was about two sixty, and you know, but but you know, no no big beards or nothing fancy to make us stand out in a in a crowd, you know. Yeah, and uh, when they told us, when they told us we get wouldn't get jobs, we actually drove about two or three hours the wrong way on the highway before I realized that uh, we were going the wrong way. Wow. All of a sudden, we're almost in Providence, Rhode Island, and then uh, I realized that oh, uh, we got to go back the other way to Canada because we were just so, we were so I don't know, we were almost floored because it felt like, felt like they liked us. We were getting dark matches and this and that. And, yeah. and then to be totally blindsided, like, ah, oh, yeah, we don't, we're not going to hire guys like you. It was just, so then we evolved. We mm -hmm. became hairy, disgusting looking Highlanders from the 13th century. <laughs> See, I can, I can kind of relate to that a little bit because uh, in, in the tryouts that I had uh, around 2010, I think you had maybe just left maybe a year prior to that. But uh, I had a confrontation with John Laurinaitis uh, similar to that. And I, 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 it paints a picture to me of him being someone who, you know, he probably gets a lot of people coming up to him, asking him for jobs. Every every person off the Indies that can manage to get him for a minute. Uh, I managed to get him for maybe about 15 minutes or so. And I think a lot of that was him just trying to trip me up. But uh, very, very similar kind of situation. But what I'm getting at is when I look back on that, uh, I had my answers, but it's because I was confident in me, but also the fact that I saw that you know, this company kind of hires anyone. Like there's no set pattern of they're going to hire people who fit this and this criteria. Yeah, they want guys in shape. Yeah, they want, you know, girls that look a certain way, but they could just as easily hire someone who's maybe never wrestled a day in his life that was, you know, got some kind of outstanding ability or has really well, nice blue eyes. They they do that and they're going to go back to that again, yeah. supposedly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to go back to just hiring guys that have no experience. Yeah. Um, that's just what a rumor I heard, but they, I know what it is. It's, it's not a rhyme. When you think about it, it's, they pick who's ever playing politics, right. And who's 
getting in this agent's pocket or this producer's pocket. And, you know, John Laurinaitis gets, John Laurinaitis gets the same question asked all the time about getting a job, but you're getting it. You're not really getting a job through him. You're getting a job through someone else pushing for you. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not really him. And the only reason we got jobs there was because we came in and baffled basically blindside Stephanie and Vince. And we just looked like something so different. They had to have us. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and you bring up a good point because one of the things I've been most vocal about is how we're at a disadvantage as Canadians, because you got all these guys on the American independent scene getting tons of exposure. Um, you know, they changed their hiring practices now to where they're going to go back to hiring people who don't have experience. But just before that with NXT under triple H, they were hiring tons of independent wrestlers, tons of people with experience except that they were hiring people who predominantly were wrestling in the United States in companies like PWG and uh, GCW Evolve. They, they had a direct partnership with Evolve, uh, which limited Canadians because, you know, the border really restricts our ability to be able to go and perform in these kinds of places. So it's not even just the fact of people aren't seeing us booked there and thinking that we're not good enough to be booked, but it's that we don't get to rub shoulders with the VIPs of the wrestling world, with the so-called talent scouts, who are rather going to go put in a word for, you know, the guys that they're close with, the guys who maybe, you know, make them laugh in the locker room uh, more so than the great talents that exist all throughout the rest of the world. So I think that's been something that has held back a lot of great Canadian talents. And, you know, we know the business is mostly backstage. It's, it's the politics of it, like you say. So not having that person to lobby for you and push, it, I think it's stopping a lot of great talents from here in Canada of getting onto that bigger stage. Absolutely. 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 Cause it's a, I know the the demise of the Highlanders at WWE was not Robbie going to TNA. The demise of WWE was that we didn't have that game in our back pocket. We didn't have that political game where, you know, Stephanie and Vincent liked us, but what did we do to keep it? You know what I mean? And And as soon as... You know, you might, it's a politic game because people are always stabbing you in the back and it's always, it's, and it's even the same thing with the producers, you know, they're all, they're, everybody's conniving against everybody back there because you want to keep your spot. That's just how it is. Didn't know how to play the game that well at that time. Yeah. And that's, and that's unfortunate. Maybe to a certain extent, they, they want that. Maybe that's why they want to have people who don't have experience in the wrestling business going in there so that they can dictate what the rules of the game are and you know create the type of environment that, that they want where they can control people and, and not have anybody upset the apple cart. Uh, I, I don't know. I haven't been there. I've, I've had you know brushes with being there, but it, it doesn't surprise me. With these when, interviews, yep. When you said uh, upsetting the apple cart, hindsight for me, I think that was our problem we should have actually upset the apple cart mm -hmm. once in a while because then you show some balls yeah yeah no definitely but i mean again hindsight like you say it's it's different where you're there an opportunity that you worked your whole career for you're kind of maybe just grateful to be part of the show and yep. don't want to risk it and, and I, I had an interview i did not too long ago with jimmy jacobs where he actually said it's the same thing for the creative team that they're all on eggshells because they have ideas they want to get through. But he says, you're always one odd interaction with Vince McMahon away from being shown the door. And everyone's just kind of, you know, wants to play it safe. Don't want to get caught in the crosshairs when Vince is having a bad day. So I can imagine that, you know, if it's like that for the writers, then the wrestlers are probably dealing with the same level of, of you know, anxiety, paranoia, uh, worry for, you know, job safety. And, you know, who knows if the situation is going to be made worse. Um, I, I, I feel for you, really. Um, but, but, but all that to say, you know, you, you guys did have a good run. Uh, I, I think it was a, it was a great run. Um, a lot of people don't get those opportunities. And you guys, I think, made the most of it by having something original. And uh, they, they gave you guys a pretty good amount of uh, TV time. You got vignettes leading up to your debut. And uh, while you didn't get the tag titles, I mean, you know, you still had a lot of great memorable matches, rivalries, um, yeah, pay-per-views, Monday Night Raws. What What are your most fond memories of your time in uh, in WWE? My my biggest, I I don't know. One of my biggest memories is the main event in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. It was the Highlanders versus. Uh, at that time, it was Paul Burchill, who's an Englishman, 
and Dave Taylor. And Dave Taylor used to be tag team partners with William Regal, as everyone knows. And they actually cut our match that night. Um, and me and Dave Taylor went out the night before in Cape Town, South Africa, and we got annihilatedly pissed until about, oh, time to get the flight the next day. And uh, we got to the building that night, and Ricky Steamboat comes up, and he says, uh, he says, guys, we're going to have to cut your match tonight. And me and Dave Taylor are like, yeah, <laughs> this is great because we're hungover bad. And But we asked, you know, why are we getting cut? And he says, uh, promoter didn't get rain insurance, and he's got to have a 90-minute show. Well, hmm. it looked like it was going to rain the whole night, and it never did rain, and they got up to almost 90 minutes, and Steamboat comes back. He says, guys, you're the main event. Go on, put 25 minutes in. Wow. And we tore the house down that night in front of 30,000 people in Tennis Stadium in Durban, South Africa. And that's one of my, to this day, it's one of my most memorable things because by that time, I was a much better worker and could actually just ad lib and go out and do, just go and work. Not, not what they do today where everything's, every punch, kick and everything is choreographed. I, I still don't wrestle that way today, so. Mm. Yeah, no, it's important to be able to, to, to be able to do both, you know, so that way you can work with as many different opponents as you can. So I think, uh, again, it falls back on what we started the interview with of how sometimes people look at the old school and say, oh, that's not how we do things now. Well, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not something that could still serve you well in the future when you find yourself in that kind of a situation where you got to ad lib 25 minutes in the main event. I find I find here's the best, like going out on an indie show, if depending I'm on the East Coast right now, living on the East Coast. And Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, they're so old school. They bring a lot of kid, a lot of kids come to the shows. And you know, you can't give them a spot best. You just got to give them good versus evil. And, mm -hmm. and it's such an easy formula. You go out and rock the house every night. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Nothing beats good versus evil. That's what the business was built on. And, and you know, you look at MMA, you look at combat sports in general, it's still the biggest seller. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that's pretty cool. You got to do that main event in South Africa. Uh, I can't help but feel like maybe culturally the idea of Scotsmen against, uh, against guys from England, there might be a, a bit of a thing culturally that the people might have rallied behind as well. In, in, Durban, in Durban, there is an English population. A Scottish, but yeah. there's a lot of population from a lot of places, but heavily English and Scottish influence. Yeah, it probably had that kind of like uh, football, rugby kind of feel to it for that crowd. Yes. So like, I think it's pretty cool that they had you guys in that main event. I, sidebar, though, I always found Paul Birchall was an outstanding worker. Like, I really feel for his level of talent and ability, he didn't even come close to reaching his ceiling in uh, WWE. I believe he might be another victim of being too nice and not playing the game right. Mm. It's politics and it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, it, we had Sabu on for an interview and uh, you know, he, he, he said it best when we said, you know, what happened to you when they restarted ECW and WWE? Why is it that, you know, you went from being a focal point there and, you know, after a while you kind of just became an afterthought in a brand that was built around, you know, characters like you. And his answer was simple. He's like, I didn't have a, I didn't have a friend in the office. I didn't have anyone in the booking meetings who was, you know, lobbying for me and saying, Hey, you know, this is Sabu. We got to treat him better than this. We can't just have him going out and doing jobs to Zack Ryder in uh, three minutes, you know, and, and it really put a lot into perspective that if you don't have that, that friend on the booking committee, there's, there's no one to watch your back because they're the ones deciding. Yep. It's all getting in someone's pocket. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, with that said, I mean, would you ever consider going back, whether in a, an agent role or, you know, even to do maybe like a one off you and uh, Rory do like a Legends match? Uh, I, I thought about it a couple weeks ago. I said I probably wouldn't, uh, but I've had a little couple, couple weeks to think about it. Um, I don't I don't need wrestling at all. Um, I'm 49 years old. I'm pretty much retired. Um, so now I'm at that point where I've been in the ring a few times and I'm starting to get the itch <laughs> and I don't really have to be in the wrestling ring, but now I'm at that point, I'm doing nothing else, but you know, just renovating a house that I'm going to sell and make some money off of down the road. And I need something to do. So 
now I'm thinking that, you know, it wouldn't, I, uh, character development would be a good job for me at WWE in Florida. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, or, let's put or, that, let's put that clip out there. Maybe, uh, maybe even do a match, but one thing I'm not going to do is go and look dumb. That's mm-hmm. I, I refuse to do anything in wrestling where I'm going to look stupid. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's, nor should you have to with no, everything that but, you've been through. But there was times where I had to look very stupid for the company. And, and I will, I, I'm in a position in my life that I will never have to do, you know, I, I'm not in a position where I need 500 bucks. So it doesn't matter, you know, if they, if they wanted me to do something stupid on, on television, I'm not going to be there to do something stupid on television for 500 bucks or a thousand because I don't need it. Yeah. I, th- this may or may not fall under one of those times, but um, I did get to see you live uh, on, on a few occasions. And I think that I got to see you live in a few unique matches too. Um, we, we actually talked about this one of the times we were on a show. I think we were both on a show for, um, I think it might've been for Chris Thorne in, in Ontario. Um, you and Rory were on there. You might've worked with Thorne in the main event, you and Rory. Um, but I know we spoke in the parking lot after that, that would be where I got this crooked nose from Chris Uh, Thorne. Ah, (laughs) probably in that match, Jeremy. (laughs) It's funny you say that we share that in common because I've had, uh, man, I I was on tour with Thorne. I think I worked him every night and, um, you know, I, 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 I accumulated a few bumps and bruises here and there, but there was also this one match that we did in Cornwall, Ontario, where uh, something went a little awry on a power slam he gave me, and I got his elbow. I got the point of his elbow right in my uh, in my eye. I think I damaged my my orbital. I had an eye that was like out to here afterwards. I was cut in two places, uh, cut on my nose and cut above the eyebrow, and my eye was like a like a balloon from it. Uh, probably the worst thing that ever happened. I wrestled the next day, uh, which I probably shouldn't have, but uh, I think that was the most <laughs> the most pain I felt in a match <laughs> was from that. Um, now I'm going to try not to get sidetracked here, but, (laughs) but I spoke to you in the parking lot and I had told you that, uh, one of the matches I saw you in was in Ottawa. Um, and then, like I said, maybe this falls under stupid things they had you do, but it was in Ottawa was you and Rory in a two on one handicap match against the great Kali, uh, in an arena that I think could maybe hold, let's say five or 6,000 people. And there was probably a thousand at most. It was pretty sparsely packed. Uh, but I was there for that uh, that that two on one squash match that you did. Yeah, that was that was right at the beginning of all the shit that was happening. I believe that's that was that was pro that was probably right at the beginning where I believe um, some people will tell the story different, but I believe when right around there was when the Highlanders were um, basically going to be on their way out the door mm-hmm. and. You know what I mean? Going to get used up. And other people tell it different that we were on every show and this and that at the time. But we we're on every show to get used up so we can go with it. That's just my personal opinion. Mm. And you saw the match and, you know, we didn't get nothing on Kali. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really felt it was beneath your rank and station for even what you were doing on TV at the time. Because uh, you guys were still in the mix. And then, you know, you guys, you guys even, you got a pretty good pop when you came out um, in Ottawa and then Kali comes out and I'm, I just, I thought it was actually going to be Kali and a partner against you guys and no, it's just him. And I think they were maybe heating up Kali for his feud with um, either with John Cena or with one of the, one of the top baby faces. Uh, it just was unfortunate that they used you guys like that and in Canada uh, to lose that kind of a match. Really thought that was unfortunate booking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was. Then there was the midget and all kinds of stuff after that. So. Yeah. So this is another thing. I have this memory of there There was a match on SmackDown. And, and maybe I imagined it, but I feel like there was some kind of a match you guys did with Mick Foley and, and Hornswoggle. Yes. And I, I, I don't know if that was SmackDown or Raw, but I remember doing well with Foley and Hornswoggle on SmackDown. Yeah. And I remember. Rory, Rory tore his peck. In that match? Yes. Okay. Because I always found that interesting because I, I feel like, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that was probably Mick Foley's last match in, in WWE was that one with, uh, with with him and Hornswoggle against you guys. My my neck still hurts from that double arm DDT. Oh, yeah. Foley stiffed you on the DDT? Oh, my God. <laughs> it, hurt. it hurt. Still hurts today. 
because it, it always looks stiff that move i never uh, i mean i assumed it was safe but it, it always looks stiff when he did it um it was stiff that night yeah. but maybe i just took it like a shit ball so oh, maybe, maybe someone in the office gave him the iggy and said hey you know these highlander guys they're upsetting the apple cart you gotta gotta give them the business <laughs> <laughs> they're on their way out so get do do a number <laughs> so, so in, in thinking back to the the timeline of of the highlanders like i said you know they gave you guys those great vignettes when you came in and you know i think you guys had worked your way up to the tag titles um but i kind of get the impression i don't know if it was the same for you guys but i feel like it was when they started introducing crime time that they kind of positioned them ahead of you guys in in the pecking order of who was going to be you know getting the next shots for the tag titles Abs absolutely when uh when Crime Time got together in OVW and came up, Vince got a huge boner for it. Hmm. So, and is if here's the best thing: if Vince has got a boner for it, you're gonna you're gonna make some money. Like, and this is what I mean. So we did four, probably three months on the road making decent money on house shows before the and anyone ever saw us on television. Hmm. You know what I mean? So. If, if the boss likes you, you get all the perks and you're getting everything for until until the next thing comes along. That's yeah. just how it goes. Yeah. So really, it was a case of them them just being the new shiny toy in the toy box. Uh, Pretty much, the yeah. kilts weren't shiny enough anymore. <laughs> did they Did they ever give you guys merch when you were uh, when you were the Highlanders? Did they they well, put out any shirts? Um, we didn't really have much, but I got this guy right here. Mm. Pretty cool. We got uh, we got one with the brown, the brown and uh, brown kilts, and then we got ones with uh, with reddish style kilts. Oh, cool, cool. The likeness is spot on there. The the the, the you know the what? Pecs, he, the abs. The... Definitely my twin. If yeah. I had my hair down, definitely my twin. Just saying, the bi biceps might be a little a little oversized, but but the rest is spot on. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> fair point fair point i always it's funny because i got for some reason i got I, I believe i have really good biceps and my brother's a bodybuilder mm. and uh he's training for the canadian championships right now oh cool and there's been times where i've said you know you're you're by because i i believe my biceps are bigger and, and, and the oh boy does that ever <laughs> stay uh, it gets all because look, look, look even the side yeah yeah it's some good good tricep definition <laughs> there too yeah the whole thing wow amazing um so it's genetics and i'm lucky yeah but i do go work out so yeah and, and natural yes that the, yeah. the important part you know you mentioned pre-wellness and wellness and whatnot just you know for the record did the wwe were they the ones putting pressure on you did was it laurinitis or, or someone there who was you know saying you guys got to get bigger because that's no, always been a we, thing in um, wrestling we came in right when the wellness policy started hmm. so um, me and Rory were jacked and we got off the stuff and he stayed pretty decent size. And I, I went down to about 218. And so we were pretty good size, but I believe that, uh, you know, um, because we were so brand new, we, we might not have been able to get around the wellness policy. Mm. <laughs> so, so you're saying that some people were maybe, uh, they maybe looked the other way. Yeah, I could, I, I can't say I know for sure, but you never know. I'm, well, there was it just when I see guys when I when I just for example I saw some guys that uh, would go out on injury and they were huge come back and they're smaller than me and within two months they're twice the size of me so I was like I, hmm. I don't know yeah. they must they must get good protein I just I, I've never been able to find good enough protein to 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 really do that you know. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've had a lot of guests on and, you know, we talk about the issue performance enhancing stuff, steroids, all that, but the, the testing never really gets discussed. Uh, maybe you can give us some insight. Like, was it random testing or would you know in advance, Hey, there's a test coming up, uh, better make sure you're clean. Well, basically they only, they tested on Mondays or Tuesdays, television days. So never house shows. Mm, you know what? I think maybe once, but I think it was one time deal. Um, but it was probably just to bust a guy like me for weed because <laughs> I like to, I like to smoke the weed yeah. and it's much better than alcohol. So, <laughs> and, and, and they apparently recently removed weed from the wellness policy as well. Well, it, 
they owe me money then. Because yeah, because I heard they, they used owe to me find, money. If, they used if to if find. They took it out. They owe me. They owe me a lot of fifteen hundred dollar weeks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that that was maybe one of the main reasons why Brian Kendrick ended up quitting when he was in the middle of getting his push was because they they kept hitting him with the fines and then he you know told them that he should have uh, he should be exempt because he has his license in California and it's legal and uh, yeah you know to be honest with you they uh, that that's a whole other issue <laughs> that doesn't involve wrestling but it just it it's a, to me it's a farce because. Um, you know, people don't smoke joints and rape women, you mm -hmm. know, people get drunk and rape women mm -hmm. and alcohol is legal. Yeah. It's yeah. always, it, weed's, weed's pretty much legal now. So, but you know what I mean? It's people don't peep. And, and the only reason I can touch on this is because I drank a lot of, I'm alcohol got me in a lot of trouble. Um, probably didn't help me in WWE and situations. Um, I haven't drank for a year, but you can do, I, I've never smoked weed and really done stupid shit or mm. make dumb, dumb decisions like I would on alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I made some really dumb decisions while I drank. Yeah. And I mean, research is showing that, you know, marijuana has so many medicinal benefits to it. Um, and, and, you know, especially if you're going to be somebody who's on the road 300 days a year, sustaining damage to your body, back uh, pain, good for back pain. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I think that it's unfortunate that there's a lot of misinformation that's put out there and, and people seem to think, oh, you know, weed is so bad. It's this terrible thing that we need to be punishing people for putting people in prison. And, uh, you know, I hope with the, with the policy change, it shows that they, they finally, you know, decided to actually look at the real research that's out there that shows that, uh, a lot of what people used to think is just highly blown out of proportion. Do you, do you know why? Do you know why it became illegal? Um, well, uh, what I've heard, and I'll even cite my my source here. It's a, a great Canadian fighter by the name of Elias Theodoru, who used to be in the UFC, and they actually um, released him because he, even though he had a therapeutic exemption for most athletic commissions, I think it was either Nevada or California. They didn't uh, want to uphold that. And he has a condition that marijuana is the, the best way to treat it. So he parted ways with the UFC despite being a top uh, top 15 fighter. He wow. said that it's it's old, outdated, uh, racist beliefs that uh, allowed people to think that weed was this thing that could give black people superhuman strength. And um, playing into a lot of... You can look it up. It's, uh, it's from him that I got that info. I've never uh, heard that one. Yeah, he said that the, it was it was that they they believed you know the 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 racist people in in the South in the U.S. and they put it out there said that this marijuana can give give a black man superhuman strength which would allow him to go out and 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 beat up police officers and and rape women and do all kinds of crazy things. So because of this old outdated racist way of thinking, this went into law and it got passed throughout uh, you know most of North America. I did not know that. I I was told I was always told it was um, the pulp and paper industry. Um, were afraid of uh, that hemp could take their money away from them. Oh, I mean, it's probably all those things. Maybe that's really what's behind it. And then they get the propaganda out there. Oh, and, I mean, the know. propaganda, they can make all kinds of big stories with that shit. Yeah. Like fear what you just told me sounds so far fetched. It, it doesn't even sound like it could ever be real. Yeah. I'll, we, have, uh, we have all the same genetics. I'll, I'll, I'll tag, I'll tag Elias Theodoru in the, in this clip and we'll, we'll get, we'll get his take on it. He's very outspoken on it. The man should still be fighting in the UFC. Absolutely. Uh, another great, another great Canadian. Um, Absolutely. That's and has been a, shit. been a total trailblazer for uh, legalizing marijuana. And that, that's why the UFC has now legalized it too. So, you know, slowly but surely people are getting on board. Um, so just, uh, you know, backtracking it to, to, to WWE and all that, obviously you had the, the incident, probably the thing everybody asks you about was with the appearance on TNA. Um, I remember watching and they they cut to you in that episode. I think WWE was in town. Was that WrestleMania weekend? That was that was WrestleMania week in uh I want to say Orlando. Well, yeah, that's where they taped. So yeah, it would make sense that it would be Orlando. Um so I mean walk us through that. You were just stopping by to say hi to some friends or what was the you deal? You know, I, I was at Universal that day and Technically, I never really thought about it, but I went and said hi to some friends, and then they're like, "Oh, you want to come in?" And technically, I I believe 
at that time, I can't really think of how I felt now, but I, I was in a real bad spot. And I knew that I did not want to be in WWE at all anymore. Uh, our, we got into a situation, I'm sorry, but getting pinned by a midget, mm. just where do you go from there? Seriously. Yeah. Yep. You know, I, uh, you're, your stock is, you have no stock when you're getting pinned by a midget. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was just my basically big old F you. And, you know, a lot of people got pissed off and, and I'm not, you know, it, we all do dumb things. And I was drinking back then. I don't, I wasn't drunk then, but we do dumb things. Uh, and it, it was probably the dumbest thing I ever done that but in a way, I think it was a big F you because, you know, I was starting to look stupid and I, and I was tired of looking dumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, everyone has their pride and, uh, you know, everyone has their, their breaking point when it comes to these kinds of things. Uh, so I totally get where you're coming from. My take on it is this, though, <clears throat> because I feel like if they were going to do this now, I don't know all the details, but. If they were going to do, because it was a taped show, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think that 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 it was it was live when they they showed you on there. I want to say that they were they were running live, but they were about a minute difference on the, at that time. Okay, so so I mean, they made the conscious decision, anyways, to put you on there. At, at no point did anyone from TNA come up to you and say, "Hey, can we, you know, maybe cut to you? Can we put this kind of a name bar?" Can did, no, no, so, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett just put me on there and they pulled up what name they could find on the internet, who I was. And I've talked to Jeff Jarrett about it. And at that time, like I say, I was, uh, I was in a really shitty spot mentally, hmm. not wanting to be there. And, you know, it still took six months to get fired from there. So I had to sit around. I had to, I had to hang out for another six months and do the job every week on, on, dark matches. Mm -hmm. Um, so I mean, just to me, I feel like someone should have given you some kind of an Iggy there, some kind of a heads up of, Hey, you know, we're going to do this. And e even if, you know, I get that you agree with it now and in hindsight and whatnot, but at the same time, they're tam tampering with somebody's li livelihood doing that. But technically I should have never been there because I was stupid. <sighs> it, you got it. We, we can look at it any way we want, but the real blame is me. Uh, because I was in a bad spot and I didn't want to be in WWE and mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have dumb, you're going to have stuff. You're going to have repercussions when you do something that yeah. at that time, did I think it, it, it's almost like it was immature, but at the same time I was lashing out. It was, I'm not the type of person that's confrontational. Mm -hmm. I don't like to get in fights with people, but when, when your back's to the wall and you're treated like a, piece of shit we're kind of getting a little emotional here but when i've been in other relationships where you're a nice guy and nice guys finish last and mm -hmm. people start to uh, people start to take advantage of you and when you get your back to the wall you lash out and do anything you can to say f you this is over we're done mm -hmm. i'm done being your bitch technically right. hey man's <laughs> man's got to do what a man's got to do yeah uh, Nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, was there any backlash when you went back to WWE? Like, did somebody pull you aside? Or oh, some... they, John Laurinaitis had called me within a minute after I walked out of the building and said, "What's?" <laughs> I got a phone call and uh, it was a secretary saying, "Hold for John Laurinaitis. You got a call from John Laurinaitis." Hmm. He's like, "What's one of my talent doing at TNA?" <laughs> and then I went back to the, I went back. <laughs> I went and because I'm man enough to be able to face my own bullshit, I walked right back into the into the WrestleMania hotel and I mm -hmm. faced it like a man from everybody that wanted to give me shit. Oh yeah, Undertaker tore a strip off me. Oh wow, uh, Fitz Finley tore a strip off me, and at that time I didn't really care because what happened at WWE was not what I thought was going to happen. I thought it was going to be, and and when you look at it, you make you create your own destiny. You guide your own ship. 
I obviously didn't guide my ship the right way. I didn't, mm. but when, when you do your work and you're man enough to look at it all, it, it wasn't WWE that did me wrong. I did WWE wrong. I did, I, it, it, no, I didn't do them wrong. I did myself wrong because I didn't do anything to keep myself there. Mm. Didn't do anything to steer my ship. You have to, you have to be in the pocket telling ideas constantly. I never had that. In my, I knew I have a wrestling ability. I'm a good wrestler, but I've never really been the storyteller. Uh, Want to get into the storyline shit, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yep. Yeah, no, but, but the good thing is, <clears throat> the good thing is, is that you can impart those lessons on the next generation, on people like me who, you know, will actually hear this and be able to learn from this. And if ever I'm in a situation, you know, this is, great advice. And I hope the same for anyone who's listening to this, any wrestlers or aspiring wrestlers that you can learn these lessons and, you know, already have this in your back pocket for when the time comes and you're in that situation and know how to handle it. Um, I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, you know, during that time, that's another time that I saw you in action was during that, uh, that, that time after you had appeared on TNA and there was probably some heat on you and they had you doing jobs and dark matches. Uh, I got to see you in one of those dark matches in, I want to say it was in uh, a SmackDown in Buffalo. Uh, no, it was either Albany or Buffalo, one or the other, because they used to do uh, Raw in one and then SmackDown in the other, and I'd end up going to both shows. I was a very big fan, and as as I was a wrestler, too, I'd do a lot of traveling to a lot of places to see a lot of events. Um, you did a dark match. One of the best ones I've seen um, was you against uh, R-Truth when they were just bringing him in. Bam! It was such a good match, that one. Really good match. Truth, Truth gave me... When we went over that match, he gave me a lot. And that match, I I really wish I could see some footage of that match because mm. that match was that match was excellent. And and Truth gave me a lot and he got he gotten shit in the back for he gotten shit in the back after the match because he gave me he made me look great. Mm. He mm. made he made me look like I could kick his ass and beat him. And he, you know what I mean? He, it, it, that's, that's probably one of, one of my favorite moments in WWE as well, because I didn't look like a piece of shit. No one was, I, I got, I got to go out and kick ass and be the wrestler. I really should have been. Yeah. But life, life changes, life goes on. And 49 and pretty much retired is a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, you know, that match, like I was there, I saw it in person and, you know, people probably never get to see it because it wasn't on TV, but I was there in person. I saw it and it was at the time where Rory was still out. And I, I will even say from a fan perspective, watching that match to the point of what you said about how good he made you look, I was under the impression that the match was a showcase for you because they gave you like a new Titan Tron, a new, new entrance song and everything. And I, I think it even said the Highlander in, in the, in the video. And like, you know, you were going with this heel approach and it seemed like it was a repackaging of you, that this was something that they were going to try out to, to put you back on TV. That that's how, how the match looked to me. I mean, tr truth, truth, I think is a, a top, I think he's one of the greatest of all time. Really. I think skill wise on the mic, the way he looks, his in-ring ability, I think he can do it all. Um, but to me, I think it speaks highly of, of his ability that like, this was supposed to be a showcase for him. I was of the impression it was a showcase for you and you guys had a hell of a match together. You know, I, I really wish it was, <laughs> but I believe, I believe from like matches like that, I became a really good singles wrestler at the end of my career mm. and really enjoyed it. And, you know, I, the tag team was great. Uh, one thing when I get into something, I'll finish it with them and then I'll go on. I don't, uh, I, I don't want to finish something that I, I like I say, I'm not a confrontational person. I hate breakups. Um, but you know, me and me and Rory went in there together and we left together and, you know, I did try to get back in myself, but I think I got myself enough heat from what I did that they were never going to look at me for a long, long time. But I, I, I got myself backstage a lot after Mm -hmm. And then John Lauren, I decided to tell me one time in Buffalo, he said, get it. Don't come back. Mm -hmm. He says, you're sneaking into the bill. Don't come back. I tried so many times, you know, yeah. and that was in Louisville, Florida, all over the place. And, and I just, I create, I guess I created enough heat from that incident that 
But then again, I wasn't in anyone's pocket either. So yeah. <laughs> but you, but you never thought maybe of you know another company maybe like like AEW or even even Impact. I think that kind of bring things uh, pretty full circle if it were if it were Impact. I think um, right now I'm now that I'm uh, I've been back in the ring a little bit. Um, I've had some good matches. I'm probably just as good as the kids that are 25 in ring shape, maybe, and uh, I believe that. I got a lot of bookings right now and I, I want to actually do these. I'm going to run a couple little angles, um, maybe out here on the East coast. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, uh, maybe I will start knocking on some doors. Yeah. definitely. Uh, a year long run or a two year run wouldn't be a bad thing as Highlander Robbie. Um, maybe no one will give me a chance cause I'm old, but, uh, or they're going to give me a chance cause I'm old and I look the way I do. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, age is just a number and, uh, you wouldn't be the oldest guy on impacts roster considering that pco is there and he's got uh, quite a few years on you you know still Absolutely. keeping up with the joneses out there so i definitely think uh, look there's a place for you in this business you have a lot of knowledge you can impart so whether it's in the ring behind the scenes uh i think they'd be leaving money on the table if they didn't at least give you an opportunity and i'm pretty sure you'd run with it i i i believe i i'm i'm gonna work towards something like that yep. as i keep as i keep writing my music yeah. Well, we'll be uh, we'll be sure to get the clips out there. We'll tag the right people in it. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at, you know, if there's one thing that Jeremy Prophet is all about, it's uh, making a lot of noise and making sure that I get hurt. So um, that's something I take to heart, not just for me, but for my guests who come on here, uh, because I think that anyone who comes on here, I want to use this platform to be able to boost their signal as much as possible. So as many people can hear what they have to say. Um, you mentioned your music just now. Uh, I'm not familiar with this. Maybe you could tell me and our listeners a little bit more about that. I'll just I'll just rip a little something. Okay. So I started writing music and playing guitar uh, a lot more when COVID came around, but hmm. this one's just inspired off my wrestling career. Okay. My first career, it wasn't no big thing. It was driving down the road. Working in a wrestling ring. It brought me around the world and it gave me fame. And then one thing happened. No one knew my name. Oh, oh, oh let it go. On to the next show. If you don't try now. That was awesome. Just a little bit. That was awesome. I'm a little when, nervous. <laughs> Nothing to be nervous about here, brother. That was that was some good good music. But when, when's the single dropping? Um, I'm actually, I got about four or five songs I'm working on right now, and I want to actually go record three soon, but. Like I say, I talk about it a lot before I ever get it done. Mm. But once it happens, it happens and it starts to roll. So that's amazing. I'm, uh, I haven't been, I, I've been playing for a lot of years. Um, but when I picked up a guitar in 13, it might have been five to 10 hours a year until pretty much COVID. And then I really started putting it together while I was drinking and. Then I quit drinking, and now I want to do something else. And uh, music was a dream when I was a kid. And uh, one thing uh, Derek or Highlander Robbie does is follows his dreams. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know, I hope that you can put that album together. Hell, I hope you can take it from coast to coast. You know, from uh, St. John's all the way out to BC, and uh, I would love to everywhere in between. <laughs> I, th I think that'd be amazing, you know, even even if it if it coincides with maybe, uh, you know, maybe opening performance or intermission performance at wrestling shows, they can see you in action and they can see you performing as well. I was thinking that this one will be a great song for a WWE pay-per-view. Hmm. It does have <laughs> it, it, it does have it, it, it almost reminds me now that you say that it almost has that feeling like the old uh, sacrifice videos like they used to do at the start of the show. You know, yeah. they'd, they'd have Kid Rock do the, the Lonely Road of Faith and. It has that same kind of vibe to it about being on the road and show to show. Because my like, so that was my first verse. It was about the wrestling. Then the second verse is about what I did doing a salesman. 
and then the third one's going back to living my dreams. So amazing. Well, you know, I, I won't uh, I won't keep you any longer because uh, you know obviously you have uh, a lot of important things to do. But it's been an inspiring uh, hour here with you. Really appreciate all the knowledge you've dropped on us. Uh, appreciate you being so candid about all those stories. Just before uh, we wrap this up, I want to turn the floor over to you so you can let people know where they can find you on social media, any projects or shows you have coming up, anything you want to plug. The floor is yours, my friend. Um, all right. So you can catch me at Derek Robbie McAllister Couch on Facebook. Um, anyone can look at that, message me or anything. Um, I do have 5,000 friends on there. Um, of which so I, I can't add more friends. Or you can catch me at at Highlander Robbie on Instagram. And uh, right now I'm booked out uh, pretty much uh, in the Maritimes, uh, Atlanta, Canada with East Coast Pro Wrestling and UCW. And I'm just going to start uh, getting myself back in the ring, hopefully get back to Ontario for a bit and uh, start heading all over the place again. Yep. Awesome. Glad to hear that. And I do hope that we get to have a match one day. Um, I think it's long overdue, but I definitely feel I could learn a lot from you. So uh, I, I, I'm more than welcome. When, yeah. when, when are we doing it? <laughs> uh, hey, I, I just, I just got to start harassing some promoters up here and uh, making sure that they, uh, they do the right thing, bring you in, maybe have you do a seminar so people can also learn from you. And then, you know, we can do a hell of a main event. We can definitely do that too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I thank you so much for being here as our guest. And uh, if ever you want to come back on, you're more than welcome. We'll gladly roll out the red carpet for you anytime. Uh, with that, this has been another episode of Jofo in the Ring. For Highlander Robbie, I am Jeremy Prophet, the Harbinger of Truth. Thank you so much for being with us. And don't forget that wrestling is life. So, Jofo. I'm a gargle a shot for Kurt Hennig and everybody before we go. Oh, no. Joe Fo, thank you guys.